Good evening. Can you guys hear this? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. My name is Victor Manuel Serrino. I'm a political science. I'm a senior in political science and international student uh, studies. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the uh, Institute on World Affairs, which is funded by the government student body and the political science department. I would like to remind you that next Thursday, November the 6th, we will have the Iowa caucus workshop. Uh, this workshop will teach you how to participate in the upcoming Iowa caucuses. Uh, and the workshop will, be ta will take place in the Great Hall, that's right next door. Um, and the upcoming week after that, we have uh, Janine Sakaria, she's a uh, Washington Bureau Chief of the Jerusalem Post. She'll be talking about U.S. diplomacy in the Middle East. Then the week after that, on November the 11th, uh, uh, we'll have um, Henning Loos, I guess. She's a German, uh, he's a German uh, journalist. He'll be talking about the war in Iraq uh, and the view from Europe. This will also uh, be in the Great Hall. Uh, but today, we continue with our series, Outside Looking In, foreign policy, American Foreign Policy After September the 11th. Our guest tonight is Dr. John C. Halsman. Dr. Halsman is a research fellow with the Heritage Foundation, Davis Institute for International Policy Studies, where he examines European security and NATO affairs, the European Union, U.S., European trade and economic relations, and the war on terror. He makes regular appearances on ABC, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, PBS, and the BBC. He was a fellow in European studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington and taught world politics and U.S. foreign policy at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. His books include A Paradigm for the New World Order and The World Turned Right Side Up, A New Trading Agenda for the Age of Globalization. Uh, he also recently contributed a chapter to an upcoming volume critiquing the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. Dr. Holtzman has traveled extensively throughout Europe and the former Soviet Union and lived in Scotland for seven years while earning his doctorate and master's degrees in modern history and international relations from the University of St. Andrews. There will be a reception following Dr. Holtzman's presentation in which he has candidly agreed to answer any lingering questions you may have after the Q&A session. Uh, but without any further delays, please join me in welcoming Dr. John C. Hoffman. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, when I left Washington, it was 82 degrees, and my staff were in shorts, and delighted that I wasn't going to be there, I think. Uh, we're in shorts, and uh, we, were, we were praising the benefits of global warming, I have to admit. <laughs> Um, and I came here on the plane, and I was sitting there, and I hadn't read the forecast. And the pilot said, you know, the, the flight would be on time. There'd be a whole bunch of closing, so I was delighted to hear the flight would be on time. And then he said, and when you get to Des Moines, it will be a balmy 26. And I looked at the guy next to me, who, who was an Iowan, and he said, he's kidding. And he said, oh, he's not kidding. <laughs> um, but despite that, thank you for coming out. Uh, it's, it's delightful to see so many people. And um, I'm an Ohioan, so we, we, we rough these things out, don't we? Um, I'd like to talk to you about Europe and the United States tonight. Um, but saying that, and I lay myself open for a savage questioning later, um, I play a pretty broad center field at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, for my sins in my youth in Scotland, where I spent eight years of my life, very happy eight years of my life, um, I, as an undergraduate, took a meaningless class. In fact, my friends asked me, why are you wasting your time? studying the organizational structure of Al-Qaeda um, and have sat on Council on Foreign Relations task forces on what to do about Al-Qaeda and sadly also what to do about Iraq. And so questions that are farther afield uh, than just Europe relating to trade, Al-Qaeda or Iraq, I'd be pleased to enter into the mix later. So feel free to hit the pinata when you can. Um, but, but I'd like to talk about Europe. A, what happened to lead us to the state that we're in? B, where are we? And C, the only question in Washington anybody ever asks me, what do you want me to do, John? That's great. Your analysis on TV, very funny, clever, charming, whatever. Just tell me what you want me to do. And if you can't answer that question in a very practical, policy-oriented way, nobody will listen to you. And, and frankly, I don't think that's a sign of our shallowness. I think that's a sign of our practicality and our genius for getting that right here in this country. You should be able to answer 
what it is indeed that you ought to do. So I'm going to have a modest proposal and try to actually answer that question in my own imperfect way. But first, um, how did we get here? Well, we got here a couple ways. I'll start, I'm a, I'm a former academic, so I'll start with my academic answer, with his method, which is methodological. If I were an analyst grading my, my graduate class on U.S.-European relations, I would fail everybody. And this is why. Europeans who are to a man Wilsonian, it's, it's the striking characteristic of foreign policy in Europe. They have one school of thought. Perfectly legitimate thing to be, Wilsonian. But that's pretty much all they are. European Wilsonians for the last 12 years haven't invited, guess who, to have orange juice at Rome, Paris, London, Berlin, all the places I get to go. Guess who they invited? American Wilsonians to conferences. And so they, and I can name the 10 people they invited, all of whom are my friends, by the way. Um, they would say to them, well, we, we don't have any differences. They're, they're just bumps in the road. Everything's the same. There are no real problems here between us. And they were entirely right and they were entirely wrong. Indeed, with the six people in the room who now don't control the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, or the executive branch, indeed, there were no problems. But they have no power in Washington. They didn't reach out to two other institutions that have been around that are both internationalist and foreign policy thinking. Realism, which, and I'll say this now, I'm a realist, uh, we've been around since the Jay Treaty of 1793. So this is not a small mistake that they made. Alexander Hamilton and the Jay Treaty, that's us. Um, or neoconservatives, not my group at all. And as I'm not in Washington, I can say a few mean things about them and then pretend you all misquoted me, which I'll be pleased to do. But the neoconservatives have been around since Irving Kristol and the Trotskyite movement of the 1930s, so they've been around for 70 years. So surely the Europeans have not done their homework by inviting American Wilsonians to meet European Wilsonians over orange juice for 12 years, proclaiming the end of history. Not good enough. On the other hand, I would castigate, and I won't pick on my own people, of course, I'll castigate the neoconservatives. If you believe the world is truly unipolar, as the neoconservatives are, meaning the United States is the new Rome, that's all there is out there, the world is an inert tabula rasa for me to write on, why would you ever leave Washington? If all the power in the world is located in D.C., why would you go off to France, however fun, the cocktail party? You wouldn't, and they haven't. And so over the last 13 years, what you have are Europeans, and I can name the five uh, organs they read, Liberation, Le Monde, um, I write for Corriere della Sera, all of which say exactly the same thing with the same group of people. It's a cottage industry self-referentially talking to the other 15 European Wilsonians with the odd guy from Brookings thrown in to prove that they're international. And that doubles for discourse. And American neoconservatives reading the Weekly Standard and going to picnics together saying, as long as we don't include anybody else, we're going to be right. This is groupthink of the rankest order, and we certainly have not served the world well, any of us. And, and I will say this now, the realists are no better. We, we, uh, we read the national interest. I have my copy in my hotel room tonight. Um, we, we, we read what? Policy review. And we go to conferences run by primarily Heritage, also AEI to an extent, and, and a few Cato folks who are defensive realists. And, and I can name the 15 people that I hang out with. And that's simply not good enough. And one of the things I love about being here and being out of the hothouse orchid environment that is Washington is the fact that I'm not afraid of Socratic clash. And I think we should have a discussion about these things. I think we should have 13 years ago. Uh, talk about Nero. We were fiddling while Rome burned. We were talking about the end of history. The Greeks would call this hubristic, arrogant, and stupid. And we missed these points. And the reason we missed them was methodological, because we only talk to people who agree with us. Now, I will say that the Europeans have tried to play catch-up. I've been to Paris four times this year, Berlin four times this year. Uh, as long as there's a rift, I'll never be lonely because I'm one of the few people to say that there was a rift. And I said there was a rift when I started my working career about six or seven years ago, and it was thought, oh, he's a young Turk, he's hot-blooded, it's a good thing, but he's wrong. Because NATO has experienced many crises before now, and this is just one of the same. The key thing for an analyst is this point. Is what you're experiencing part of a larger trend line, or does it break from the trend? It's very, very hard when I have, like you guys, 150 email every day to figure that out. But that's ultimately the question. Is what we're experiencing more of the same 
or is it something entirely different? And I thought it was something entirely different. And a, a friend of mine who's a Wilsonian, Charlie Kupchin at the Council on Foreign Relations, who also thought there was a problem with the U.S.-European relationship, would go to meetings where we were told we were both young and wrong. And so every time we went to a meeting, we would add to a list as to the differences between Europe and the United States in a fundamental nature. And my shameless plug is if you go to the Heritage website and look at my testimony before Congress on this point, we have a list of 73 separate areas of disagreement. And this became a game, that every time they'd say that, we would add two more things that were different. The point is the differences, when you add them up, lead to a very, very different worldview. Because structurally, and here I speak as a realist, I don't live in a bipolar world anymore. Everybody I talk to had the Cold War as their fundamental organizing principle of their existence. It's not surprising. If you're not my age or younger, it makes perfect sense. But I didn't live in a world where the Cold War, where a bipolar world with the U.S. and the Soviet Union dominating it, dominating it, made a whole lot of sense. And if you're a European, and you're not now constrained by the fact that every disagreement with the United States didn't matter because you had a gun to your head, that gun being the Soviet Union, once that's gone, there are bound to be greater differences. There are bound to be greater differences. The question for our time is do we manage these differences, or as my grandmother would say, do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? That, that's the simple question. The differences, now everybody thinks we're right and says, good job, well done, guys, all that. That's not the point. The policy question is, can we manage these differences, or is Iraq going to be the beginning of the end of the transatlantic alliance, which has been the most successful alliance, I would argue, in the history of the world? And, and it's that stark and it's that simple. But to start with, I think none of us have, have, have covered ourselves with glory over the last 13 years. So what happened? Well, it all began, as most things do in Washington, with a mistake. Never believe Oliver Stone. None of us are competent enough to run a conspiracy. <laughs> I've, been to, I've lived in Washington seven years. We're just not that good, okay, to run a conspiracy theory. What happened was the United States and the Bush administration over the diplomatic row over Iraq made a calculation, though lazy, that made sense. The calculation was this. This will be more of the same. Go back to that paradigm thing. Meaning, the Chinese will abstain, as they always do, in every major vote. Meaning, they hate what the United States does, but they don't want to get in our way because they think there but for the grace of God go I, and that we will see them as our enemy. So they abstain on every major vote in the Security Council, as they've done for the last 25 years. That was pretty much a given. Now it begins to go wrong. The one other thing they did get right was the British, who would behave as Sundance to our Butch Cassidy. The British in 1956 made a calculation entirely opposite from that of the French. The British said the Americans are crazy. We don't like what they're doing over Suez, so we can never let them act alone again. We must always agree with them strategically and fight our battles tactically and whisper in their ears, Macmillan said to Kennedy, as the wily old Athenians whispering into the ear of the Br British Romans. When I say this in Britain, every Brit laughs and nods, so this is still pretty much what they think. The French said, the Americans are crazy, we must balance them, which would have been fine if we weren't, in terms of power, fighting a man the size of the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> not a bad policy, not enough power to make it work, which is a lot of the American frustration behind the French doing this. You talk to this guy and you're like, well, I don't understand. But the policy really does devolve from the Suez Crisis in 56. Both of them behaved as one would permit, you know, that they would. The key point was Russia. Nobody went into this like Blofeld stroking the white cat saying, we're either going to dominate the world or, or we're, going to, we're going to balance the United States. It just simply didn't work that way. Everybody thought the United States would get the Russians on board, as we did on missile defense, as we did on NATO expansion, as we did on WTO accession as we did on Soviet debt rescheduling, as we did on Russian debt rescheduling. That this would be just another in a series of steps about Putin who had turned decisively to the West in the tradition of his hero, the reformist czar, Peter the Great, which I still think he is. But we didn't send anybody there. Whereas before, on missile defense, we sent Condi and Rummy and Hadley and the Wolfman and the VP and the Prez and Powell and Armitage and everybody went for the photo ops so the Russians could maintain their very wounded pride about no longer being a superpower. It was handled really very well. On this point, we simply said they've gone along with us on everything else, so they'll go along this time. We didn't look at the fact that the Russians have parliamentary elections in December, that there's a nomenclature in Russia, 
still very much opposed to America based on, on Cold War grounds, sniping at Putin, and that if we didn't make the effort to engage Putin, we weren't likely to get a yes vote, when he could simply say no, curry the favor of all the people there, and still be pro-Western. From Putin's point of view, it makes perfect sense. We were lazy technically about going out to see Putin. And indeed, the Secretary of State, didn't even, who I'm a fan of, didn't even bother to go to Moscow. I think this was a huge, huge mistake. And as a result, the Russians began to waver. Now, with the Russians wavering, the Chinese still in their usual abstention position, the French, in their typical opportunistic way, see an opportunity here. Deep in their hearts of the French, they are all Gaullists. They want to create a pole of power to challenge the United States. But most of the French elite are simply too smart to think this will work because they know they're the Wizard of Oz. Their economy isn't big enough to challenge us. Militarily, they can't challenge us. Industrially, they can't. Demographically, they're facing a nightmare. They don't have the ability to challenge us without allies. Okay, they can't. And those allies, by the way, have to stick. It can't be one issue. It has to be a general anti-American position. President Chirac has held every position you could possibly hold in his adult life. He's been for the cap. He's been against the cap. He's been for the EU. He's been against the EU. He's been for farmers. He's been for reform. He's been for military strength. He's been for military weakness and saving the money. And if he weren't president, undoubtedly, like Prime Minister Berlusconi, he'd be indicted. Rightly so. But he is an opportunist in the sense that he knows an opportunity when he sees one. With the Russians wavering, he said to the Russians, and with the Germans, who are not in the Security Council, very much off the chart because of political considerations we can talk about later. Again, politically, what, what Schroeder did made perfect sense. Strategically, it was disastrous, but politically, it got him reelected. Politicians care about getting reelected. They worry about the strategy later. Okay, and you know, all the people I knew in Germany say, yeah, we know it was really dumb, but look, we're in power and you have to talk to me. As far as that goes, that's correct. So knowing that this coalition was brewing, who went out and actually went to Moscow and talked to Putin? Chirac and Vadrine, the former foreign minister, and Villepin, the current foreign minister, and every other French guy who mattered. Jacques Lang went out there, and Kuchner went out there, and pretty much, I, th I think Henri Lévy, even their, even their philosophers went out there, which in France is important. Even they went out and did this kind of thing. The guy with the long hair you see on French TV, he went out there, looks good, has almost nothing to say. Um, he went out there, but they engaged the Russians and won them over. So suddenly you have a very different situation. I knew we were in trouble the day the Chinese said we might not abstain. My next call was to the Russian embassy saying, what's going on? The Russians said very clearly to me, what's going on is you didn't bother. Okay, now, how does one look at this as an American? There's, there's good news and there's, and there's bad news here. The good news is this coalition isn't long for this world. Okay, the reasons that the, the, the big three, the Russians, uh, the French and the Germans, who are the three who have to hold together in terms of power size. They're the ones that matter. The reason that this coalition um, is unstable is that they didn't do what they did for the same reasons. The French did it for traditional Gaullist reasons, as I've suggested. The Russians did it for political reasons, as well as wounded pride, as well as American diplomatic incompetence. And the Germans did it largely for electoral reasons and public opinion reasons. The German populace is increasingly pacifist and not Atlanticist, and that's a big change. And, Poo and uh, Schroeder got that right. But all these reasons are different. That's not a coalition likely to hold together over the long term over all the other issues it would have to to challenge the United States. And in fact, the only way it seems to me that coalition will hold together is if my neoconservative brethren in the Republican Party force them together by punishing them. I don't know about you, but my relatives were Puritans. We had burned witches and stole land from Native Americans and all that kind of stuff. And when I hear this notion about punishing people in Europe, nobody else understands it, and I put it down in my background. The worst thing in the world to do would be to punish the Germans and the Russians, because what happens when you do that? Who do they go to? The French. I can't think of a dumber policy. I can't think of a dumber thing to do. The point is... If you indeed want to make the French impotent, which will drive them crazy, you re-engage the Germans and the Russians as quickly as you can on as many issues as you can, which is where I've been trying to lead American policy and writing nasty things about my own party. Right, but not good for the career, but necessary, because that's the way to keep this from forming a bastion against the United States that would be permanent and create a pole of power to challenge us. And by the way, a pole of power run by Paris, given current proclivities, and I, I list just a couple, um, if you ask the French who caused September 11th, 
the number three answer would be the Mossad or the United States or some combination. Uh, this is an emotional thing. This is not a rational thing, and that makes it dangerous. Um, and so we want to divide this. The good news is it's easy to divide, because the other story, the good news coming out of this, is not a notion of Europe versus the United States. It's a notion of Europe versus Europe. The rest of Europe said to France and Germany, you do not speak for us. The British, the Spanish, the Italian, the Polish, the Romanian, the Estonian, the Lithuanian, all these governments and more, 18 in total, said, we're with the American government for our own national interest reasons. But we're with the American government and we're not with France and Germany. Nobody in Europe cares about Iraq. Nobody in Europe's ever going to visit Iraq. Okay, what they care about is how do you feel about American power and the intra-European political dynamic that's going on at the moment. Who gets to run Europe and what kind of Europe do we end up with? That's what they talk about. That's what preoccupies them entirely. And that's what this debate became about. As always in these things, it ends up being about things that have nothing to do with the technical rights and wrongs of is Iraq a good idea or a bad idea, which in questions I'm more than willing to talk about. But the more interesting thing is you have an entirely divided Europe. My favorite comment was Prime Minister Othnar of Spain, who by the way has lowered unemployment in Spain from around 22% to around 11%. He's been incredibly successful Premier of Spain, won two full terms. And, and when asked why he was siding with the Americans, he said, well, so I can play them off against the French and the Germans, because I'm tired of France and Germany stitching up deals over the European Union on agriculture without inviting me. To an American's ear who doesn't follow this, that makes absolutely no sense. But that is the reality of what's going on here. That's exactly, you know, when you're reading page after page of this stuff, a moment of clarity, a moment of truth, because that's indeed what it's about. So how does the United States deal with this situation? I'm a Burkean conservative, meaning I look at the world as I think I see it, and not, not as how I would like it to be. To make it better, I have to see it as it is. One has to start there. That is the first principle I would base the policy I'm about to mention under. And the, the view of Europe I'm about to give you is not wildly flattering, but I think it's incredibly consistent with the reality of what's going on. One, economically. The OECD numbers, European organization, are staggering. Since 1970, there has been a net private sector job loss in the Eurozone area. Let me repeat that. Net private sector job loss in the Eurozone area. Meaning, in Europe, among the countries who joined the Eurozone, they have lost more jobs in the private sector than they have created since 1970. It isn't working very well. Secondly, it's unlikely to work much better because the three countries at the core of the Eurozone, France, Italy, and Germany, have a demographic crisis that makes ours look like nothing in comparison. Um, the capitalization rate of pension funds in these countries is all under 10%, meaning they all want to retire at 55 and with 85% of their last paycheck, which is the current Italian system. Well, you can do that, but only if one of four conditions persists. One, you're willing to raise taxes. Well, in continental Europe, you can't raise taxes. From where they are, from the astronomically high levels they're at, European tax rates as a percentage of GDP are about 50% on average. American rates are about 1 in 3. Britain's about 41, 42%. It's kind of in between the two. But they're at 50%. You simply can't raise them and be competitive. So they can't do that. Two, you take in a whole lot more immigrants. I always torture the Germans by mentioning this. I said, well, I can solve your, your problem now. Take in 3 million more Turks to which they laugh nervously and ask me if I'm out of my mind, because politically that's simply not an option there, though that would indeed solve their problem. Three, you reduce benefit. They laugh nervously and say I'm out of my mind about that one too. No European wants to give up their seven weeks vacation. And that's the difference. Germany's the great example. The Germans are every bit as productive as the Americans, depending on how you measure it. The point is, I don't know about you, but I, I think I got three weeks this year. It was my big boost. But between two and three weeks holiday, literally, they have about double the time, and they're just not doubly smart to us. I say that to them, you guys are good, but you're not that good. And that's the problem. Nobody's going to get rid of their benefit and be reelected. And so that, that would be the, the third problem. The fourth one is that they reproduce at a greater rate, so down the road there are more people to pay for this pension system. That also would work. But they're not. In fact, the opposite is happening, particularly in Italy, um, where contraception has just come in, really, in the last, say, couple generations, and if you look at birth rates, they're not replacing at, at, at the rate of zero, meaning that, that far, far fewer Italians are being born. So whereas before, 
four or five workers would work to sustain one retiree. The number is now three Italians work to sustain two. You just simply can't do that and talk seriously about balancing anybody. And there's no political will to deal with this problem. That would be, that would be the, the last thing to say. My, my favorite moment here is during the French campaign, in a moment of Rooseveltian greatness, uh, Jospin and Chirac cut a deal where they said they wouldn't discuss the pension problem because it might win Le Pen the radical votes. So they didn't talk about the number one crisis politically affecting them. Not a mark of great bravery there, in my opinion. There simply isn't the will to deal with this politically for the reasons I'd suggest. So economically, you have, you have an area that is moribund. Remember 1990, we all talked about the Trilateral Commission. We all talked about a world that the United States, the Japanese, and Europe stroke Germany would pretty much roughly divide on economic basis. Well, Japan now is a disaster. We just don't want their banking system to collapse. You know, it's totally changed. Remember those bad movies about we're all going to work for the Japanese? Now we just don't want their banking system to collapse because that would really, really hurt us all. It is their weakness that we fear, not their strength. Germany is growing at a rate, according to the government numbers, which are cheerleading numbers, of zero this year. Last year, 0.2%. year before that, I believe, was 0.4%. No growth. Zippo. No East and West convergence. East Germany is no longer catching up economically to West Germany. So I, I, don't see, I don't see an economic challenge, to put it kindly, on the horizon. I'm more worried about failures. Militarily, when I started my job before the Orange Juice Conferences, um, three countries in NATO could actually do things out of area, had a large military that was deployable out of area for a period of time. They were France, Britain, and the United States. After all the work of all these conferences and all these think tanks, three countries have deployable troops in NATO out of area, France, Germany, pardon me, France, Britain, and the United States. 25 years from now, after many more orange juice meetings, three countries will have the ability to act out of area, France, Britain, and the United States. The trend lines are down. The Germans spend 1.1% of GDP on defense. The French, the British, and the Americans spend between 2.5 and 3%. They don't pass the laugh test. And given their economic problems, they're not about to spend more money. The Spanish spend 0.9. The Italians, depending on how you count it, anywhere from 0.75 to 1. They're, the Poles, bless them, are also not going to spend enough. So however you look at this militarily, there is absolutely no change. And if there is change, it's a weakening of the European contribution. The European market as a whole is bigger than that of the United States. And yet they spend two-thirds of what we do on defense, and they get 15%, yes, 1-5% of the capability. When I brief the senators, that's the only number they know. They all know the 15 number. They all say we're 85% of NATO. All of Europe together is 15. That's not healthy for any alliance. But it certainly doesn't mark a challenge coming down the road. And then lastly, politically. To put it kindly, in Iraq, the big three acted as national interests would really lead them to act rather than as a EU-wide position. Nobody in Washington said, quick, get Prodi on the phone. I need to talk to Commissioner Solana about what to do about Iraq. Lots of people said, get Schroeder or Chirac. Or, or Blair or Athnar or Berlusconi on the phone. And until that changes, the notion of a common foreign and security policy remains laughable. Because ultimately, how did the big three act on the seminal question of war and peace? The British were Sundance or Butch Cassidy. The French reflexively said, well, if you do it through the UN, meaning you have a veto over American action, that's OK with me. But if not, then no. And the Germans said, under no circumstances, because we have elections. Not really a unified position across the board. There is no sign of that unity on issues of war and peace, which after all is why you create a foreign and security policy. Yeah, they can agree on aid to Ghana, but on the major issues that actually motivate a foreign policy. They simply aren't in agreement. On China, for instance, they don't have a policy. They're so inward looking. There is no policy. On Iran, they just about do, kind of. Uh, on the Middle East, well, to kind of support the Palestinians vaguely, whatever that means, but they don't really explain what that means. Uh, and that's a great frustration, is that when you talk to them about what would you do, you really don't get an answer. So my, my, my view of Europe is one of economic weakness, political division, and military impotence. Does that mean, like my neocon friends, I say, aha, let's go home? No, because we don't live in a unipolar world. We live in a world where the United States is chairman of the board, depending on whatever the issue is, but there are indeed other board members. And we ought to go out of our way to go and engage them as much as humanly possible. 
absolutely as much as is possible. I'll give you an example where a cherry picking strategy, as I call it, makes perfect sense. Issue by issue, case by case, because Europe is divided. I'm not dividing it. It is divided in a Burkean sense. That's the world I find. And I need allies. I need to go out and engage these people, but not through Brussels, where there is no unanimity. The two examples I give are Kyoto, where whatever one thinks of the treaty, I think it's a horrible treaty. It will never be implemented. It will never be lived up to. No European state has remotely lived up to it. But by saying no in the way that the United States said no, they actually unified the rest of the world against them. Horribly dumb manner of which to deal with the world. On missile defense, they didn't believe the Financial Times in London, which said Europe is against it. And they actually went out and talked to people in Britain, Spain, all over. They sent all the dignitaries over. They listened, they engaged, they argued, and in the end, they won over the British, the Spanish, the Italians, the Poles, the Hungarians, and the Russians. Now, that's not everybody in Europe, but that's not no one either. And that's how the world is going to work, de facto. Because it isn't unified, if we bother to ask them, which we must do, which is where I don't agree with the neocons, we will always have allies. If we assume that there is unanimity against us, we won't. Or if we assume nobody matters, we won't either. But we simply must ask them. We must see the world as a more complicated place. We must still look at the national level because this is the level upon which European politics and foreign policy still reside. It makes it a lot more complicated, a lot more frustrating, an issue-to-issue, case-by-case approach. And the model I actually use is President Clinton's, and I'll, I'll never forget this, that Clinton's sitting there one day on NAFTA with all the Republicans, 90% of the Republican parties for NAFTA, 80% of the Democratic parties against it. He engages the Republicans without annoying the Democrats. The next day, health care is the issue, where all the Democrats are with him and all the Republicans are against him. And he manages to make it work without anybody being offended. That's the price of doing business in the real world. That's beyond ideology how we move forward. That's how we get over the conundrum of having either a veto, allowing Belgium to veto our major security interests, which I'm not about to do, or saying allies don't matter. This is the sensible middle ground. And I would leave it with this operational note. I think we can all agree, and I've said to my Wilsonian colleagues, Mr. Brzezinski, the elder in particular, he said, do you agree, John, that full NATO is best? If you can get a full multilateral institution to agree with you, is that not best in grand style? And I said, well, it's big here back on the planet Earth. Um, yes. That is best, and we ought to try to do that in a good faith effort, and I would agree that the present administration has not always done that. Do you, sir, agree if that is not possible, then rather than do nothing or taking my ball and going home or being either isolationist or unilateralist or all the things the Europeans hate, a coalition of the willing within NATO would be the next best? Well, yes. And if we can't get that, a coalition of the willing outside of NATO? Yes. And if we don't get that, bilaterals with, as, as Claude Rains would put it, the usual suspects, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, the usual guys, would that not be good? And then and only then would not unilateral action if we had primary interests be best. Would you agree to that, sir? Yes. And I said, well, then we've cut the best of all deals because you think you've given up nothing because I'm about to make a good faith effort in NATO. And I, as a realist, think I've given up nothing because I can't get full agreement in any multilateral institution. Perhaps upon the basis of that conceit, though, we can actually get beyond this cartoon view that America is unilateral or multilateral or that there's something wrong with being either of these things. And we can simply work down the decision-making tree in a way that means that we're grown-ups. And I, I would end with this point. We're in a place in Europe, and a Frenchman said this to me in a typical kind of Frenchman way, the first generation after NATO were the Romantics because they were the people who had been through the two wars, who'd seen the, the total destruction, and knew NATO was their last best hope. And so they had an emotional, even romantic attachment to the alliance, as they should. And again, I think Harry Truman is the best foreign policy president ever. I said, as a Heritage Foundation, I have a picture of him in my office. Good realist. Second generation, the French said, of course rebelled against their fathers and said, oh, NATO is just a tool of the United States. All these things are just things created to further American domination, the usual kind of European left bank wearing black, glowering at you from a cafe, screed. Um, I actually wrote that in a French newspaper. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. Um, and they actually liked it. But they went the other way. But then in Hegelian nature, my generation, the third generation, I think gets it right. My grandfather fought in the first war. My father fought in the second war. I went to Europe for eight years to chase girls. And as my father said, things are looking up for the Halsman family. Don't you forget 
why you are where you are. And he's absolutely right. We shouldn't. But we have, I think, a less romantic view and a more pragmatic view of the alliance. We must engage allies on every issue. But we must not let, on the other hand, the lack of consensus for our European friends and their diplomatic confusion stop us from having to deal with the problems of the world that simply don't go away. I do not have the luxury in this era to not engage the problems of the world any more than Harry Truman, Franklin Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Ronald Reagan, General Eisenhower did. And if we can get away from the romance on both sides, we might actually have a lasting relationship. Thank you. find out the government is on the side of the United States and the people aren't. The British are just about throwing their government out because the government says something and the people think a different way. The French, the government is on the same side as the people and the rest of the Europeans are the same, the Italians and the like. <clears throat> Even in this country that you put it solidly in one column, when you look at the country as a whole, this isn't all one way of thinking from one end to the other one. How could you put these things in one column as if they are on the American side when in reality things are totally different? Because we, the question is, how does public opinion really play into this? And, and, and the reality is we don't elect people based on the Agora system of the Athenian democratic view. And Spain is the great example. You're quite right in everything you said. Um, about 80 to 90 percent of the Spanish were against the war. They just, in, in a series of regional elections, despite 80 to 90 percent of them being against the war, uh, gave the largest plurality to the People's Party of Prime Minister Othnar, who was for the war. Meaning it wasn't the only issue they voted on. It never is. It shouldn't be. We don't elect people to vote in the Agora on every single issue. We don't all go out and say, what's your view on free ch trade on China and somehow have a national plebiscite on it. Public opinion as a, cause as a causal factor in foreign policy simply doesn't work that way. The reality is over time, if you can't explain yourself, you're voted out as is right in a Republican system. But obviously, Prime Minister Othnar and lowering unemployment from 22 to 12 percent, and the fact that the socialists under Zapatero are very divided, and in fact, the reason the Madrid race was rerun was the two socialists actually deserted his party and joined with the, the popular party of Othnar. They voted on all these other issues, which in the end, the people in Spain decided were more important than the vote on the war in Iraq. And, and that's the reality of the world. And the one area I would quibble with is Blair. And this is another great example. Tony Blair's not going to be thrown out by anybody. I deal with British politics, and I lived there for 10 years. That's the point. You've got to beat somebody with somebody. Yes, has this gravely wounded him? I entirely agree with you. Who's going to beat him? The Tories? I work with the Tories, trust me. They're not about to beat anybody. Okay? There's that. And by the way, they're pro-war. They're, they're with the Americans, too. So even if they did, it wouldn't matter. The Liberal Party's the punchline to a joke. It's got 23% of the populace behind it. They're not going to beat anybody. The only alternative to Tony Blair that's against the war are the left wing of the Labor Party who scare the horses. There's no way Middle England is going to vote for the left wing of the Labor Party, which is why Tony Blair got picked in the first place, because he's not a standard Labor guy. He's more like a Gladstonian liberal from the Empire days about 1880, which is why Middle England like him and paradoxically why his own party don't. But the one thing his party do like is winning. They like winning a lot. And nobody yet can beat him. Gordon Brown, who would be the only alternative, his, his good friend, and there's a Shakespearean story that needs writing, the Blair-Brown relationship, a betrayal, friendship, you got everything there. But the reality is Brown is probably more pro-American than Blair is. He spends his holidays on Cape Cod. Blair goes to Tuscany. Brown is an economist and talks about the dynamism of the American economy. And the best bet is always to be more with America. So there simply isn't a replacement based upon that war view. And I think that's how one has to look at foreign policy. We don't have a knee-jerk view that people are for or against something like we read a football score. It just doesn't work that way. It filters down. Now, if over time every single thing Othnar does is anti-public opinion, he'll be booted out. But obviously he did enough so that he could take this stand that was based upon national interest as he saw it and simply ignore the populist. And as I might add, Harry Truman did over the Marshall Plan, which never had 50% approval. NATO formation never had 50% approval. 
I can go through the list. There are plenty of things the American government's done. Franklin Roosevelt getting us into the Second War. The Neutrality Act's being done, done away with. Woodrow Wilson entering the First War. None of these things ever had majority opinion. We actually pick people to lead in a Republican system and then make them explain themselves to the rest of us as you guys are doing rightly in the Iowa caucuses and if they don't explain themselves you boot them out but we don't vote issue by issue which is precisely why the governments of Europe chose to do a different thing than their populace because they understand the power relations I think better. Um, how wise is it for NATO to engage in this Baltic to the Black Sea program that would include all these new governments that are markedly less stable and maybe have different internal policy and international policy goals than, say, the traditional NATO nations. The question is basically is the new round of enlargement a good thing for the cohesion of NATO? And, and we sure went around about this. I remember. In the end, I came down for being four of the seven for the big enlargement. But I, I spent a lot of time in Romania. And you go to Romania, and, and never have a people been so really horribly done by. I mean, they've, they've endured Hitler, Stalin, and Ceausescu back to back to back. And you go two blocks in any direction from the capital, and you are in squalor beyond what I can describe to you. And to say that this is a free market economy ready for NATO, you gulp a few times, go out in the balcony and say, do I really mean this? Can I really do this? I have to kill myself in the morning. Um, in the end, though, I think it was worth doing. And that was a debate, by the way, that really was going on before the NATO vote amongst a lot of us. There has to be an end to the alliance. If you take everybody into the alliance, it becomes the UN, i.e., it's incoherent. It doesn't work. There has to be a limit. But on the other hand, you don't want to limit Europe. You don't want to draw an artificial line, not letting people in who then may fall back in even further squalor. Um, NATO taking in Greece, Turkey, and Portugal are the three great examples I can think of, all of which have done better for all the problems we've had in dealing with all three. And trust me, I have, I have like jars of aspirin at home with all their names on them, like particularly the, the, the Greek jar. I love the Greeks, but they are indeed the French of the Aegean. Um, and I, I love them, but I just pop an aspirin a day on them. But undoubtedly, them being in NATO, having to adopt to rules that were within NATO, made them liberalize their economies because they could blame it on us. Well, these are the rules of being in. Not us, it's the Washington guys doing it. That's good, I can deal with that blame, that's fine. Turkey, for all that, that's a very difficult relationship in a lot of ways. Um, certainly having them in, we can talk to them about human rights. We don't always win, but we don't always lose. And, and I think that's worth doing. Portugal's been a great success from this, the, the crypto-fascist regime of Salazar to now. There's no doubt that Portugal has been a great success. And being in NATO, they would say, is a major reason. That's the, certainly the view of the Portuguese. Um, so there was that view. And then there was the secondary view that let's look at these new members. These are people who are much more likely to be pro-American than the old members. The dirty secret of NATO right now is the old allies are the problem. The new allies are with us. If you're a Pole, as, as one of their former foreign ministers said to me, if you're a highway between Russia and Germany, you don't care that they're nice this week. You care about your 500-year history of them not being nice. We don't care about the European security guarantee. We care about the American guarantee, and we will do whatever it takes for you to see us as a reciprocal partner. And that tends to be the view that you run into. For their own national interests, which makes perfect sense, to be more pro-American. They are fearful of being dominated as they were by Moscow or as they were by Berlin, and they fear Brussels now dominating them as well. And so they tend to be fairly ready allies. And in fact, during the Iraq crisis, the very argument or the discussion we're having went out the window. I mean, we were ready to storm the battlements. We all had speeches written, that you need to do this to Congress. The end vote was 98-0 the easiest vote I've ever had. I mean, we spent years worrying about this. And in the end, it was anticlimactic, except for those countries, because they proved that politically they were allies. They also proved to be important strategically. If you think about where the problems are going to be that NATO's going to have to deal with, right? They're going to be in the Caucasus, the Middle East, Iraq, and North Africa, around that arc, as, as Mr. Brzezinski would put it, of instability. You want to have more troops more near that problem so that you have more people deployable to deal with it on a quicker notice. Those countries may not have money, they may not have military wherewithal, but you know what they do have? They have bases. And they're willing to give us those bases at an incredibly cut rate price to be nearer to these problems. And that was another argument in favor of them doing it. So in the end, this hesitation, I think, went out the window. I do think, though, that your question is very well founded. I think if there is a next round of enlargement, it will probably not be further east. I wouldn't want to see Ukraine in NATO. I can say that, or Belarus, or Russia, God forbid. 
Um, and I, I deal with the Russians all the time, but we're, we're not ready for that. Maybe Croatia, you know, we can fill in the blanks that way. Um, but, but I think that we do at some point have to decide how much is enough because we want this organization to continue to function coherently. NATO actually works. Okay, it's not the OSCE, it's not the Council on Europe, it actually functions. And we want to keep it coherent. And so there has to be a limit. You said you would take a more wide-ranging question. Uh, Ten years ago, there were two uh, insolvable problems, the uh, Israelis and the Palestinians in Israel. And there was also the Catholics and the Protestants in Northern Ireland. One of those situations looks like it's moving toward a peace and stability, and the other retains all the characteristics before. Why are they different, and why is one insolvable and the other one appears to have been insolvent? Before I answer this, are we on or off the record? Off? Meaning you'll get a real answer then. Okay, good. Um, um, when we don't know what to say in answer to a question, we say it comes down to leadership in Washington, but I actually think it kind of does in this case. Um, Structurally, the differences are, are there too. The key difference in the Irish one, and I, I went to university in Scotland and spent an awful lot of time thinking about the Northern Ireland situation, and still do, with my friend Richard Haas, who for his sins is tasked with dealing with that. Um, the key change is Ireland. Ireland was a third world agrarian economy not very long ago, about 15 years ago. It is now a first world economy with 97% of the GDP of the United States. And joining Ireland all of a sudden sounds like a whole lot better deal than it did 15 years ago if you're fairly moderate on these issues. The other change is that regardless of who's in power, and it was true under John Bruton with Fine Gael and now under Fianna Foyle with Bertie Ahern, and it was true under Major and now it's true under Tony Blair, 